What's up, everyone? Welcome back to another episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Row and our good friends at Byers Automotive. If you're looking for an auto, go to Byers Auto. Check them out and see what they've got on sale for you, in store for you. Uh, Spencer Holbrook over there. Uh, I'm Jeremy Birmingham. We're talking about Buckeyes recruiting. And again, we're talking about an incredibly slow time of the year, Spencer, which is unfortunate because this would have been, I think, the time of year when things really ramped back up for the class of 2021 for Ohio State because we would have been at that like end of two-week mark after all these kids made official visits, and I think we'd see some real fireworks going on right now um, with the Buckeyes, but we're not because of the extended uh, recruiting dead period, which now will run through the end of August at least. And because of that, we're grasping for uh, things to talk about, let's be honest. But fortunately, uh, the Elite 11 did take place this week. Uh, Tony Grimes made his decision, so we'll touch on a few of those things and really dive in. Um, and, and talk about the dominoes that could happen at defensive back. So let's just start there. Tony Grimes picked North Carolina, not Georgia, as I thought he would. Uh, the Tar Heels have always sort of had that advantage. People I talked to close to the Bulldogs were confident that they would just overtake North Carolina because they, they're Georgia and that's North Carolina. Um, you know, and we, when we talked about Tony Grimes being on or adding Ohio State to his Final Four list in the last month, I kind of alluded to it indirectly, but there was nobody that I spoke with that thought Ohio State was a real contender in that recruitment. Uh, I know there was some additional, you know, pumping up the Buckeyes on Tony Grimes' social media accounts, but uh, the Buckeyes were not really involved there. They did not have Grimes as high on their board as some other schools did. But you always kind of, when you're Ohio State and you're talking about a five-star player, you're you're looking for uh, that sort of connection. Mm -hmm. the Buckeyes have maintained their focus on Jordan Hancock as the next cornerback to be added to the class, uh, even after and before the Devontae Smith decommitment. So uh, Devontae Smith did commit to Alabama this week, as we said he would. Um, So, Spencer, when you look at players like Tony Grimes choosing North Carolina – ahead of Georgia, ahead of Ohio State, ahead of Texas A&M, which was the other team in his Final Four. What is North Carolina doing that you think is working? Uh, They're selling that if you're a five-star prospect and you come there, you're going to be the best corner on the team. I think that's probably the biggest selling point. Georgia recruits five-star corners every year, and Ohio State recruits four and five-star corners every year, and Texas A&M recruits really highly at the corner, too, because they're in Texas, and, well, you can just kind of do those things when you're in Texas. And then there's North Carolina, who had been recruiting, if you look at their last few years, projecting upward just because the talent level in the state of North Carolina is getting better, but but then you look at you know the corners on the roster, it's a lot of three-star, low four-star guys, and, and those will, that'll win you ACC games. But when you can tell a five-star cornerback, if you come in and work hard on day one, you will be a starter. That's, yeah. that's a pretty tough, tough sell that Ohio State can't make. Ohio yeah. State cannot make that sell no matter what they do. And Georgia can't make that sell because they recruited two five-star corners in the last two cycles. So it's a little easier for North Carolina to sell the dream. Uh, you know, I think they're, North Carolina is probably going to be pretty good this year. And so I don't think that it's going to be like a Tennessee situation where if you go – like six and six or seven and five, the dream you're selling is kind of dead. Yeah. I think North Carolina will probably be better than that. So it's a good situation for them to be in right now, but you wonder if it's a little, if it's sustainable because next year when they go after that 2022 five-star cornerback, they can't say, Hey, you'll be the guy right away because Tony Grimes will be there. So it's interesting. It's a one cycle thing. I feel like to be able to sell what North Carolina is selling, but if they can get it while, while it's there by all means. Yeah, they need to go out and prove that they are the the primary competition to Clemson and the ACC, which, you know, they had Clemson on the ropes a year ago, and you never know how different last season goes if they win that game. But they've certainly shown that they're on the cusp of that. Sam Howell, the quarterback's a a really dynamic young player, sophomore. Um, You know, my thought with them is that Dre Bly, who's their cornerback's coach, is a former North Carolina corner and a guy who played in the NFL, very well known. That sort of connection is hard to to beat in a lot of times when you're looking at a player who's from the same area as Tony Grimes, can play the same position, can have the, those comp, those conversations. Um, 
but again, from an Ohio State perspective, to to wrap that up, like Tony Grimes in Ohio State was never really a thing. So uh, I know that we should talk about it because he's had Ohio State on that final list and had the hat on the table. But the Buckeyes' preference and the Buckeyes' priority has been Jordan Hancock, the Clemson commit, for a year now, and that is still where it lies. Does that mean anything's going to happen there? I don't know. I don't think it guarantees anything. Uh, Jordan Hancock was on uh, uh, another video podcast the other day um, and, and said that he's 100% committed to Clemson, and that's it, right? But he talks to Ohio State every single day. He talks to the Ohio State commits every single day. The relationship. He was on Twitter that, with. The, he was on Twitter talking to the Ohio State commits about playing Madden the other day. Right. I mean, those. He is close to that group of guys, and. You, you certainly don't want to overhype the chances of a potential flip down the road. But if there's any chance to get a kid back on campus, then there's an opportunity. So you know, it's one of those things where I don't know, and I said this last week, but I don't think it's even a point at, or I don't think it's even at a point anymore where it has to have him on campus to, for them to potentially get a flip, but it would certainly help. And that would be, be kind of the, that be all end all as far as putting speculation to, to rest. But, you know, Clemson is obviously a position where they, they feel like they can dictate to kids. You're not allowed to go visit elsewhere. You're not allowed to do this. And Jordan Hancock is not a kid that's going to do that behind their back or, or try to sneak around. So, you know, it's just one of those things where Ohio state fans, as, as I mentioned, when Devonte Smith decommitted, there is no hurry to replace him in the class because Jordan Hancock is the guy they want to do it. And if you add another player at that spot right now, maybe that decreases the odds even a little bit. So you don't even want to fiddle around with that. Berm, I'm going to say something a little off topic, but I guess it relates to getting Jordan Hancock back on campus. Ohio State fans who tweet people, who tweet at recruits, you, would, you are going to do a lot better for Ohio State recruiting if you decrease coronavirus numbers and allow the dead period to end, then you will at tweeting at them. So I just wanted to get that in there because like the dead period, I think Jordan Hancock, it's going to come down to whether the dead period is extended because I believe if Ohio state can get him back on campus, I truly believe he will flip because I think he's close enough with the class and everything that, that you've told me and what we've heard. Yeah. Uh, I just think that relationship is very strong and sometimes your relationship can win out even with a kid who's already committed. But I, I just think if the recruiting dead period gets extended, I think it's going to be hard for them to flip. So if, if we can get numbers to go down, we can yeah, I mean, I, I don't period. know that – I don't know that uh, – <laughs> as I said, I don't know that a visit's necessary. Um, yeah. It would certainly be helpful um, how that happens. If that – I don't think that I, – I believe it was trending in a negative direction for college football to have recruiting visits at all this year regardless of the, the spike that's happened in the last few weeks. Yeah. Um, uh, I think that the long-term effect of this is going to be very negative for the class of 2021. And a lot of kids are going to have to make some tough decisions when it comes to um, making the, you know, college choices based entirely on virtual visits. So that's yeah. neither, neither here nor there. I think what you're trying to say is the summer of 2022 and 2023 could be a transfer portal haven. Yeah, exactly. Kids can't visit. If, if they can't visit, then it's going to be a, a, a thing where they're going to have to go into the transfer portal if they think they made the wrong decision. It's going to come down to, well, you couldn't visit in 2020. And uh, I think this could have a ripple effect for a few years. Yeah, I mean, and what you're talking about is, is a class, again, that, that has missed an opportunity right now to, to see a lot of places in person. And, uh, you know, we have maybe uh, discredited the importance of actual on-campus visits, but, you know, it is still something that is a part of the process and the kids and their families, more the families than the kids, I think, um, need to have happen so that they can feel comfortable with where they're sending their, their child. But um, the longer this goes, it's worse for the entirety of the class of 2021. I don't necessarily think that it's a detriment in the recruitment of Jordan Hancock because he has been on campus. His family's been up to Ohio state. Um, so it, it's really just a matter of whether or not that relationship that he has with the, the, the staff with the class is strong enough um, to, 
to, to make that change happen. You know what I mean? Hey, Berm, uh, this is kind of related to what we were just talking about. I'm just, I'm curious and I'm wondering because now you've got me thinking, do you think that the class of 2021 could almost be like a college basketball thing where guys go to, you know, the lesser known guys that usually get discovered in their senior year will go to a smaller school and play really well. And then two years in, transfer to a bigger school where they probably would have went in a normal cycle. Do you think that could happen? I mean, I because think like in college basket in college basketball, you see a guy like go to, I don't know, like Yale and average like 21 points a game. And two years later, he's in the transfer portal and then he's in the NCAA tournament with like, you know, Kansas. And so I just yeah, wonder like, you know, with, with college basketball, there's 300 some teams. It's you know, yeah. what you're looking at is, is kids who are going to make either a decision that's not entirely informed and, and commit to a school based on a name mm-hmm. um, or they're going to decide to commit to their hometown or closest school that they've been to the most, because that's where they feel most comfortable. Now, does that, you know, what we're heading toward with the transfer portal, basically opening up to one time, you know, free transfers that are coming down the pike. Does that give kids a little bit of le- flexibility and leeway to say, Hey, maybe I'm just going to trust my gut right now. Uh, I mean, we could use a player like Emeka Abuka for, as a prime example, right? Uh, he's been to Ohio State multiple times. His father hasn't. If, if Ohio State's where he wants to be, maybe it's easier for him to say, I'm going to commit to Ohio State. Dad, this is my choice. If things don't work out and you want me to end up in Washington, it, I'll be there in a year. You know, if you want me to go to Stanford, I can transfer there next spring without any penalty. So – there's all these, you know, things that are, are going to be changing that we just don't know about and how it's going to affect um, everyone in college football because there, there are certain teams, Ohio State, Alabama's, Clemson's, Georgia's of the world, LSU, Oklahoma, blah, blah, blah. Like, they're always going to get the best players. Um, it's That transfer rule and, and the changes that are coming there are probably going to make it easier for them to get good players, which is, I think uh, – probably not the intended consequence of that decision, but ultimately everyone's dream is to play at one of those schools and, and win a national title. So um, I think that that's just one of those things that you look at and say, Hey, uh, maybe if I couldn't get on campus, maybe I can just take a flyer on this school. Not saying that like guys like Travion Henderson or anyone like that. I don't think they've done that. Travion Henderson from the people, you know, that we've spoken to in his high school, his coach, Ricky Irby, to, to Travion, to his family, they've done a ton of research into his decision, and he feels extremely comfortable with it. I don't know that every kid is going to take that sort of approach if they can't get on campus directly. So, okay. who knows? Just, just interesting. Bottom, the bottom line, line, though, you know, when we're talking is, is a world that's changing. We have no idea what's coming in college football. When it, I mean, coronavirus, transfer portals – the name, name, image, likeness, all this stuff is changing. And so much of it's going to be coming down the pike that I don't know that there's a, a real good way for people to uh, project what's going to happen. And, and I'm not that type of person that is going to sit here and say, I think this will happen or I think that will happen uh, on those sort of big issues because I, I just don't know and I'm not afraid to say that I don't know. So that's where just I'm at. Inter- interesting thoughts. Uh- yeah. I didn't mean to, to weigh down the show a little bit, but I know it's tight ends week. I know you got some tight end stuff you want to cover. Well, I, I, I'm never weighed down by a conversation, Spencer. I love chat. I love to talk stuff. Um, I just wish I had better information about it because right now no one really does. So um, it is tight end week. And that's what, you know, we, we are talking about recruiting tight ends. And, and again, we talked about this two weeks ago when Hudson Wolf made his decision to commit to Tennessee, but um after doing a little digging this week and talking to people, I really feel more and more confident that Ohio State is just going to stick with one tight end again in the class of 2021 as they did in the class of 2020. Both times they, they went into that cycle thinking, hey, let's go get two. Let's, but now you just – you don't need to do that. Ohio State was buoyed by the, uh, the decision of uh, Cade Stover to be a tight end. Mitch Rossi has turned out to be a very capable player. They feel like he's a, a guy that, even though he's a walk-on, serves in sort of a, a, a fourth uh, tight end way right now, the H-back tight end position. Um, and unless Jeremy Ruckert absolutely blows up and goes out and 
sets the Big Ten on fire this year. I don't think that there's a real concern that he's going to leave early for the NFL draft. And because of that, you're looking at a roster, a tight end room in 2021 of Ruckert, Kate Stover, Mitch Rossi, uh, Joe Royer, and Sam Hart, who's enrolling early, as he told us on Bermanology earlier this week. So you have five guys now, and maybe you don't need to go out and get a second um, in this class, and, and you start to turn the focus head now. The guy like Hudson Wolf. They really wanted him in this class of 2021. Comparisons that I've heard of uh, Hudson Wolf are very positive to Luke Farrell, who Ohio State staff loves. They absolutely love Luke Farrell and think he's one of the most underrated players in America. I think Luke Farrell is going to play in the NFL for a long time. And so that's why there was this kind of push uh, to add Hudson Wolf as the second guy because they felt like he was a difference maker type of a player. But unless they're convinced that somebody else is going to be able to do that, I don't think they're going to add another tight end in this class. That doesn't mean they're not going to keep looking those guys. Well, and I think part of that is also because, you know, we just talked about players taking flyers. Well, the number one class in the country is not going to take a flyer on anyone. And right. I think the second tight end in the class was based on the fact that they were going to be able to scout some of these guys in the summer and get them on campus for some camps like they did last year with Joe Royer. So I think the idea that they couldn't get a Jack Pugh on campus, they couldn't get a Mitchell Evans on campus, kind of brought down the idea of taking two tight ends because you're not going to take a flyer on an in-state tight end that you don't know if, if you're yeah. willing to take. So I think once the camps get canceled for the summer, I think it was pretty evident that Ohio State was going to be content with Sam Hart uh, and just roll from there because, like you said, that's going to be a deep room even when they lose Luke Farrell after this year. Yeah, and the thing is, with, with those guys, uh, you know, you're talking about, as you mentioned, players that they would normally have had on campus in early June to see exactly where they stand. They are going to watch them very closely. Mitchell Evans has been offered by Florida State, by Notre Dame in recent weeks. Like, the Wadsworth tight end prospect is really starting to get a lot of attention. There are some people who, uh, and myself in this mix, that think he may actually grow into being an offensive tackle. Um, so it, it's hard to tell exactly where those offers are projecting him at, but at six, seven, 250 pounds already, that's a difficult body style and frame to keep, uh, in tight end mode. So when you're more or less looking at a guy who's going to be six, seven, 280 probably, and now you're talking a, a, an offensive tackle. Um, but Jack Pugh from Hilliard Davis in high school is kind of the one I think that, um, people should still pay attention to because the Buckeyes like him. He's tip, you know, prototypical size, six foot five, 230 pounds. They like a lot about Jack Pugh. They like his, his build. They like his, you know, strength, but they really haven't had a chance to watch him play in person. And until that happens, I don't know how you can really adequately recruit a guy. So they're doing their best to, to do that. But how, how long does that take? What does he have to put on tape this uh, season with his senior season? And then there's the other topic, which is, of course, does he want to flip to Ohio State if they, if they do that? So Ohio State is not going to offer anyone in Ohio. This is sort of a thing. If you look in, inside baseball time, if Ohio State doesn't know a player is going to flip to them from the inside of the state, they are not going to offer them if that makes sense. So if you see an offer for Jack Pugh, you should know something's up. Right. They, they are not going to offer him unless they know he's going to flip. Like, okay. They're not, they won't risk the proverbial egg on the face of offering a kid who's committed elsewhere and then losing him in the end. Like the, it, it's not worth the, the PR, uh, you know, backlash. It's easier to say, well, we never offered him. We, we didn't want him. So, you know, if, if they do end up offering Jack Pugh, it's because they're confident that he will flip from Wisconsin. But if they don't, then you have to, I guess, play, the, do the mental gymnastics of, of trying to figure out, is it because he wasn't going to flip or because they didn't think that he was the right fit? We saw that a couple of years ago with J.D. Duplain, the offensive lineman from Strongsville, who they offered, who was committed to Michigan State, and he never – and they thought he would flip and didn't, and it was sort of embarrassing for the Buckeyes. And then the same thing with Nick Samak from Menor High School. 
um, at the, in the same class, another offensive lineman committed to Michigan state who they thought would flip and didn't. Um, and so it, it's sort of one of those press relations things that they do, um, well, which is smart. A, yeah. And that's a lot of tight end talk for, for one episode of talking stuff. I know you also wanted to touch on Kyle McCord. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the elite 11, we did talk about that. So, uh, Kyle McCord blew away the competition on Tuesday night in their, their uh, pro day, their combine style um, drill. Uh, he finished uh, first in that event. And overall, from talking to people there, and uh, it seems like he had a pretty darn good week. Uh, he did not win the MVP. Caleb Williams did. Um, and I want to talk about that, Spencer, because this is – Caleb Williams from the people that uh, are there, and uh, we'll talk about why we weren't there in a second, but um, Caleb Williams finished not in the top 10 uh, on two of the three days and yet won the MVP. And Trent Dilfer, who's the figurehead of the Elite 11, uh, when they awarded the MVP, and you could hear it on Twitter if you if you search, search out the clip, said, and and it's like, he put an asterisk on the conversation at the beginning. And that's when you know that something is going to be a load of bull crap. He said, just a reminder, 75% of the weight of this award is based on your, on your junior tape and your projections, what we think you can be. So it had nothing to do with the actual competition. 25% of the weight of the MVP award, which was won last year by CJ Stroud, one uh, three years ago by Justin Fields, 25% only of, of the weight is based on the actual competition, which is, I, I didn't know that in the past, and I'm, I'm sort of trying to process it now as I just found it out 20 minutes ago. But doesn't that seem absolutely ridiculous? Why have the event? Right, and, and it speaks to me about the, the, how these major – combines like the the opening and and elite 11 have kind of lost their soul a little bit i remember back in 2014 we were at uh an opening regional in columbus and there was a five-star running back who was on the um on the roster there to you know he checked in he paid his due to to be a part of the event but he had a broken foot and couldn't participate and still received an invitation to the opening despite not even participating simply because he was a five-star recruit who wanted to go. And clearly then these events are not based on who's performing the best. It's based on how the companies running them can promote the highest ranked recruits. So it's sort of just like self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah, well, and it's like, well, not to point fingers, but, you know, 247 and Rivals are the two main recruiting sites, right? Well, they have Caleb Williams as the number one quarterback in the country, and we know that going in, and it's going to be really hard for anybody to top him. Well, uh, ten guys topped him every two out of the three days. Well, yeah, yeah. but he's still the number one quarterback in the country, so – He's the Kyle McCord, Kyle McCord uh, more than uh, held his own end of the bargain up, and I think that's the important thing. Uh, it, it, it's, it's hard to go into that kind of competition and be, you know, like on top of your game for three straight days when you haven't been in that sort of setting for a while. Uh, but McCord definitely did that, and Buckeyes fans should feel very confident that Ryan Day knows what he's talking about and knows what he's looking for. Um, in a quarterback. And the reason that he picked McCord over guys like Caleb Williams and over guys like J.J. McCarthy um, was shown on Tuesday in the, the, pros, the pro combine because the accuracy and the touch with the football is what makes Kyle McCord Ryan Day's quarterback. And, and not to mention, you know, the, the size, the prototypical six foot four, 210-pound frame, but it's the ability to throw the ball where he wants to put it with the right velocity, with the right touch. That makes Kyle McCord such an important piece of the Buckeyes puzzle. To wrap that all up, though, we keep hearing, and you're going to hear, if you're a, a fan of college football recruiting and an Ohio State football fan, you're going to keep hearing about Emeka Abuka and Caleb Williams and Oklahoma. And Number one, again, let me preface, K- 
Caleb Williams has not committed to Oklahoma yet. He's expected to on Saturday. But Maryland is still making a push. It's very important, obviously, for Maryland to keep him at home. Um, so if, if Emeka Abuka's biggest concern is playing with Caleb Williams, it doesn't matter about anything else Ohio State has ever done, right? Like, if, if he wants to play with Caleb Williams, is he going to go to Maryland? I don't think so. But it, it's an interesting topic because – we keep seeing these five-star quarterback conversation, how he's going to change the Oklahoma class and, uh, you know, it's going to force all this other action in that class. But if that's all that matters to Abuka, then I think Ohio State would uh, would admit that they misrepresented or misidentified him for or, or identified him as a top target for the wrong reasons, I guess. That makes sense, or am I just rambling? No, that makes sense. That makes sense. I think McCord had a good week. Uh, everything we saw out of – the camp, uh, everything we heard out of the camp says McCord had a good yeah. week. A 45 on the pro day is, is pretty damn good, Berm, especially when you – I think he had a three, which is the highest grade on seven of his last eight throws. I think I yeah. read that. Uh, CJ, just, Stroud, CJ Stroud had a 50 last year, which was the highest ever in the event. Uh, and the 45 is an event score that is almost a guaranteed win – uh, at that event. So it, it was an obviously an extremely impressive day for him. And I do want to touch on why Letterman Road didn't go to the Elite 11. We did apply for credentials. We were approved for credentials. Uh, we had booked a hotel room. We had booked a rental car. And, and on Friday night, we were told in an email that we were no longer going to have field access and we were not going to be able to interview the players. And so at that point, uh, in the middle of a pandemic where – it just makes no real sense to spend that much money on a two day trip when you don't have access to the players or the field to do photo or video that actually mattered. Um, we backed out. So, uh, you know, I, I know that some of the other outlets were there and I think it's great that people still went, but my idea for what we should be providing uh, to our fans and readers and listeners and watchers is access that's actually um, and you know, real and up close, and not just sitting in the stands watching something that is, for all intents and purposes, a a exhibition that means nothing. Does that makes sense. Yeah, you're not just you, there either, bro. Yeah, I hope you guys out there understand. But we we had intended fully to go, but once we were told that we could not interview the players and we wouldn't have access to the field, it just became um, something that we figured it made more sense to let people follow on Twitter uh, because quite frankly, I don't think that it's something people are that concerned with uh, right now. Now down the road, maybe people will be concerned with how it pans out and how the Kyle McCord, JJ McCarthy, Caleb Williams battles evolve from there, much like they did with Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields three years ago. But um, we are a independent site trying to make uh, a living. And quite frankly, the return on the investment did not add up. Go ahead. Berm, the uh, rivalry between Kyle McCord and J.J. McCarthy is going to be fascinating in the next few It is years. going to be fascinating. It's going to be completely media-driven. Those two are good friends and talk a lot. but uh, <laughs> I, don't, we, I don't think it's going to reach the Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence media hype just because those two are like the two best quarterbacks um, that, that the, the event, the Elite 11, and the recruiting industry has seen in – you know, years, yeah. but I do think uh, the idea of the the narrative that JJ McCarthy, you know, chose Michigan, and you know, it's almost in spite of Ohio, you know, in spite of Ohio State, and uh, Kyle McCord was Ryan Day's pick. Yeah, and now they they went against each other at the Elite Eleven. It's just shaping up to be a a narrative that is driven until 2024 when those guys are probably in the NFL draft. Yeah. It's going to be a fun storyline to watch unfold. And, you know, maybe it doesn't unfold at all. The fact is they have to get to college and perform. If, if Justin Fields and Trevor Lawrence weren't two of the three or four best quarterbacks in college football, people wouldn't have talked about it last year either. So, um, you know, that's part of the whole gig, I guess. The reality is these camps, these combines are nice and they're, they're good to talk about and they're, but, Football is not played in shorts and a t-shirt and uh, you got to be able to produce when the lights come on 
and you got to be able to produce when the pads go on. So we'll see if Kyle McCord can build off of that uh, big outing and that big performance at the Elite 11. But I think the important thing is what people are probably worried about coming out of it was if he goes out there and, and, and doesn't perform well, how does the rankings get affected? Is he dropped? Is he blah, blah, blah. And I don't think that there's any reason to expect that you'll see that. So, uh, you know, as a five-star quarterback, it is important to have that sort of denotation uh, by your name. And it's important for the Ohio State recruiting class to have that, you know, mark in the class. So uh, I think that that it should be relatively safe. Uh, of course, I also am basing that on what I saw with my eyes and what I've heard from people I trust. But we're dealing with completely subjective rankings that ultimately mean very little because the kid has an Ohio has has an Ohio State offer and is committed. I think also, you know, that pro day doesn't hurt as far as he might move up. Yeah, exactly. The, the, the rankings experts get one time this summer to see these guys. One time. And it was at the Elite Eleven and he won the most important event. Yeah. So to think that he's going to move down or lose a star is is kind of absurd. And I I think it would be an injustice to the to the recruiting system if, if he if he does lose a star. Yeah, let's hope that those stars are not based seventy five percent on junior film. Junior film. I mean, I guess those ones should be actually because that actually matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but anyway, uh, on that note, Spencer Holbrook and I, Jeremy Birmingham, will be wrapping up this episode of Talking Stuff, the Ohio State Recruiting Podcast, brought to you by Letterman Row and our good friends at Buyers Auto. Thanks for watching, everyone. We'll catch you next time. Thanks for watching. Subscribe below to get the latest videos from Letterman Row. We've got Letterman Live, we've got the practice report, we got rapid reaction. Hey, and you know we got Buckeye Key with Zach Bourne. For sure. We got recruiting breakdowns with Berm. We got whatever you need. Ohio State football and Ohio State Athletics, we've got you covered here at Letterman Row.